Hey, it's been a while. You know what to do. We're in a new setup. Hello and welcome everybody to the Crypto Mining Show, your one-stop shop for all cryptocurrency news from the perspective of a cryptocurrency miner. And today I am happy to be with you guys. Just a heads up, uh, you know, this setup's completely different than what we normally have. I'm trying to replicate everything over here that was over there, but it's it's kind of expensive. So you know, if you want to donate to help do that, that's where all the money and stuff is going to is just uh, making sure that we have everything set up for multiple channels and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of what we're working on. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, that aside, we're going to be talking today about RTX 30 series are going back up in price. They have gone up by 200 percent in the past month, and it does not look to be slowing down curiously enough. So we're going to maybe talk about it, see what's going on and figure it out. I miss all of you guys as well too. It's been definitely way different. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the after show. We are going to be having an after show today over on locals. We're also today going to be talking about why is Coinbase removing Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, XRP and XLM from Coinbase Wallet, as well as Apple blocking Coinbase wallet release on iOS, wanting 30% in transaction fees. Bitcoin miners FTX contagion exposure may amplify industry pain. And then, of course, Compass Mining is launching a Bitcoin miner protection plan. This one's extremely interesting, especially considering the source. And we have a new proposal for CASPA. And this proposal is going to be changing the consensus mechanism, which probably couldn't come soon enough for a lot of GPU miners and poses a very interesting possibility for the near future, especially if you're looking at things like FPGAs or ASICs for CASPA at this time. We also have CASPA mining support on Hero Miners and a couple minor releases, including Team Red Miner and LOL Miner that we'll be covering today. We're going to get into all of that and more right after a word from today's sponsor. And actually, the sponsor is myself. And I think today's spot isn't incorrect. really a sponsor. It certainly it's is. More we're of we're just an opportunity for you all if you have interest in ASIC minor repair. ASIC minor repair is currently in high demand. And right now, there are certification trainings that you can do in Wisconsin. Now, I have some links down below the channel for a November batch and a December batch for certifications for ASIC minor repair. So if you have interest in micro soldering, Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, just general troubleshooting, and of course making money, then go ahead and check them out. You can use promo code SON OF A TECH for 5% off. Yes, I know that's not a huge discount, but it is a discount nonetheless. And it's something that I wanted to bring to y'all because I know we've been discussing the high demand for it in the chat and also just the channels that we uh, communicate on both on Twitch and YouTube. So definitely check that out. And I will be at the November event. So if you want a chance to meet me, you could sign up for the November event, even though that is short notice. And I would be happy to try to meet up with you out there. All right, so the real thing that I actually need over here is just another Elgato Stream Deck. So that'll be the first thing that we get because it's a little rough tapping on things. That being said, uh, so let's get into it. I would like to remind you guys that the channel has been being suppressed. Our Twitter was being suppressed for quite some time. Luckily, that seems to have the floodgates over there have released that if you guys can share out the stream, that's the best way to get the notification out to everybody. And I would highly appreciate it, especially in the current climate. And I think it's important that we continue to cover things in the manner that we cover things here on this channel. That being said, let's go ahead and talk about the big topic of today. NVIDIA RTX 30 Ampere GPU supply evaporates from the market as secondhand prices increase by up to 200%. Almost a month after Ethereum's proof-of-stake consensus mechanism went online, the market has been flooded with GPUs. RTX 3060s could be found as low as $99, and if you were willing to take the risk that the GPU might conk out on you after a few months, then there were some seriously sweet deals to be made. There is something that contributed or this is something that contributed significantly to one of the biggest declines in first-hand discrete GPU sales since 2009. However, for whatever reason, the secondhand GPU supply seems to be fizzing out, at least on one of the largest secondhand websites out there, eBay. 
Is this the beginning of the end for dirt cheap pre-mined GPUs? In a story we wrote just a few weeks ago, you could still buy NVIDIA Ampere GPUs at ridiculously cheap rates. An RTX 3060 could be bought for $150 on November 4th, and an RTX 3080 Ti could be bought for as low as $369 on November 7th. These are the prices which have been slowly ticking upwards since the GPU crash a few months ago, when you could buy an RTX 3060 for just $99, direct from a Chinese crypto mine, presumably. Now, personally, I never got any of those. I never heard of the $99 ones, but we'll take their word for it. However, something has changed. Since November 4th, in just 26 days, prices have increased by 200% for the Ampere series. The supply available for sale has completely fizzled out, and as of November 30th, the RTX 3060 used is going for $300, and an RTX 3080 Ti is approaching $800 used. New prices of these cards is even higher, with the RTX 3080 Ti now touching $1,200. This is an incredibly sharp hike in prices in a very short span of time, akin to the hike seen during the crypto boom. So what could be the reason behind this? Now, I like to do these, uh, these articles and react to them just along with you guys. That's something that we do. So we're about to find out what they say the reason behind this is. And I have a few ideas. One is that we're no longer getting the cheap GPUs from China, right? But there is other stuff that could be going on along with it. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm curious about. I think that if we look at the RTX 4080, for example, it does appear that there is very little, if any, interest in the RTX 4080 to the point to where scalpers have been reportedly stuck with them in their hands. And that's really interesting because the 30 series is sell is starting to dry up on the used market and the 40 series nobody has interest in except for the 4090 which is obviously selling out but the 4080 is not why would that be well more than likely in my humble opinion that's because the memory bus width was cut down from the 3080 that's the best i could see but in this article, this is the one I'm referring to scalpers left holding the bag as they struggled to return the 4080s in mass and they say, you know what they say, a scalper's pain is a gamer's gain. Actually, he just made that up because scalpers that jumped the gun on the RTX 4080 have been left holding the bag and are struggling to return their purchases or sell them on the open market under the cost basis. The news comes from Reddit via video cards and Moore's Law is dead. So the MSRP uh, are, is at $1,200, which is way too expensive, right? And scalpers have been ha, have made easy profit on much of NVIDIA GPU launches, except for this one. And this is probably the first one where they haven't, but to be completely fair, where the, the price margin makes no sense, right? And if you look at it in comparison to what we saw with, you know, the memory bus being cut down, the mining performance being worse, it, it just goes to show that this might still be slightly miner driven. Crazy, right? But we're seeing 30 series dry up on the used market and increase in cost in 200% by 200%. The 4090 is selling, which has good memory bus, right? And the only thing not selling is the 4080s. Very, very interesting, right? So, so what's the reason behind this? According to WCCF Tech, this is where the article turns into an editorial. So, educated speculation. There could be multiple causes, and the reality is likely a healthy mixture of all of these. First, it is important to differentiate between new stock and used stock. There were quite a lot of Ampere graphics cards sitting in warehouses in the supply chain entirely brand new. Then there was also a metric ton of used pre-mined Ampere GPUs flooding the market in a quantity which should have been at least in theory multiple times larger than the new GPU sitting in warehouses. From what we can see on eBay, the used GPU supply available for sale is mostly gone, which is allowing users to sell brand new Ampere GPUs at incredibly steep prices. 
Is it possible that supply equivalent to almost two years worth of GPUs dumped from mines is all gone? In my opinion, that is exceedingly unlikely. The slow trickle of price increase we're seeing since the last few months was expected to continue well into the first half of 2023. And the fact that is has suddenly evaporated is surprising the author of WCCF Tech or this article. And like I said, I think there's something to be looked at here when we talk about everything, all the distress that's going on in China right now. Because if presumably, like a lot of these GPUs were coming from mines in China, then that could be a huge cutoff there. Not to mention all the craziness that happened in Russia and with compass mining and all of that. I'm sure there's other stuff going on there too. And then the fact that I talked to Hive, uh, the Hive OS guys, and they said the, most of these guys were not deleting rigs out. They were just stopping mining. So it does look like there is a certain percentage of GPU miners that are just uh, basically turned off, but waiting, right? Another explanation, and the one I believe to be more likely, uh, uh, I being the, the author of the WCCF article says, is that the scalpers invest and invest or investors have started buying up cheap secondhand GPUs in bulk from miners and are reselling them at higher prices. This is an interesting theory. In other words, the lack of secondhand GPUs available for sale is a result of profit taking, and a lot of them might be sitting in a warehouse somewhere. In any case, the situation sucks for the consumers because NVIDIA's 4000 series pricing is quite high, and the RTX 3080 Ti, brand new or used, is available for roughly similar pricing. It also means that NVIDIA and AMD and Intel will not be facing any pressure to reduce the pricing of the 4000 series, something they would have been forced to do if the secondhand GPU market had been viable for another quarter or so. And then I think that he also like, so it says, what do you think is the reason behind the sudden price hike? He says all secondhand stock of Ampere GPUs has been used up. Scalpers are buying secondhand stock in bulk and reselling or Nvidia's high pricing of the 4,000 series has driven resellers higher or other. Now, technically I think it's other. Um, I would be more likely to believe that, you know, in this particular case, that miners are sitting on their GPUs. And in addition to that, we have an increase in uh, obviously inflation, which wasn't even mentioned here, uh, w which is going to directly affect it. We have the new cards coming out at higher prices. And the fact is, if you want to buy a 4080 or 4090, you are recommended to purchase a brand new power supply as well, upping the cost of your upgrade. A lot of gamers in general, you know, previous to this did not upgrade to even the 3000 series. So game, from a gaming perspective, if you're looking at an upgrade, most people are upgrading from 1080 Ti's, like 10 series still, and going to the 3000 series or from the 20 series to the 3000 series, but most of them appear to be on 10 series. And the additional cost to go up a, with a with a new you know power supply on top of everything probably drives the demand for 3000 series higher than the demand for 4000 series and a 4080 is not a reasonably priced card especially for its performance it doesn't seem to be something that you would want to purchase at that price you might as well just push yourself all the way up to the 4090 really and then you know, especially if you have to get a power supply and pretty much all of the ATX 3.0 power supplies are extremely expensive. So why are you going to cheap out on a power supply? You know, or, you know, if you're buying an expensive power supply already, you're probably just going to buy the top end card. It just makes sense. The 4080 is probably dead on arrival to be completely honest due to it's just overpricing. I think in general, this is getting Extremely interesting. Start paying attention to it, though. As far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to hodl silicon as hard as possible. I do think that that is a viable, uh, a viable path forward, especially as we consider the fact that if you own it outright, you don't owe anything on it. You're at an advantage. And then we are at least buffer wise from a mining perspective, safe for one more bull run on the 3000 series. Thanks to the fact 
that NVIDIA nerfed the memory bandwidth on the 40 series and AMD is just now catching up to the memory bandwidth on the 7000 series, right? So presumably the only real swap you would actually get into, at least I say you, I'm referring to me, like hypothetically would be swapping out 30 series for 7000 series AMD GPUs potentially, right? But I have a feeling that the AMD GPUs are going to be quite short, right? And that's another point to bring up when we're talking about the 40 series. What are we, or 4080 in particular, and why it's not selling? What can you buy instead of a 4080 that is as competitive, if not better, or at least more than likely? And we'll find out here in about 10 days at least on paper, looks to outperform the 4080 for this for a little bit cheaper, right? And also is going to presumably have better availability and use older power supplies, right? On the ATX standard. Well, the 7900 XTX, right? So if you're a gamer right now and you're looking at that set, like you're honestly like sitting down looking at, you know, what the 4080 offers versus what the 7900 XTX offers, you're hard pressed to want to go for a 4080, right? You can spend potentially, you know, $200 less, have better performance and not have to upgrade your, upgrade your power supply. So if that's your price range, you know, makes may, way more sense. From a mining perspective, the, you don't want to be trying to mine with the 40 series very much. It's not going to be conducive to the current infrastructure you have in place. 7,000 series makes more sense. So I think that's part of the reason why the set, the 4080 is not selling well um, as well. So there you go. That being said, things are getting wild over in the cryptocurrency space. Why is Coinbase removing Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic, et cetera? Do you guys know? Let's find out. On this episode, why, why, why? The crypto giant is removing these four popular cryptos from its non-custodial wallet. Users of Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, Ripple, and Stellar will have to find a new home for their crypto after Coinbase Wallet announced that it would no longer support the native tokens. Citing low usage, the four cryptocurrencies will be removed from Coinbase's non-custodial app in early December. But what are those cryptos and why is Coinbase removing them? We won't do a deep dive into each of these native cryptocurrencies, but here's a brief overview. Bitcoin Cash, or also known as Bitcoin Trash, launched in 2017 as a Bitcoin hard fork. Bitcoin Trash offers faster transactions and lower fees than Bitcoin, but has never quite caught up with the original because it got caught in a dumpster fire and is run by morons. Ethereum Classic, the original Ethereum blockchain, was created after a 2016 hard fork. Similar to Bitcoin Trash, Ethereum Classic has never reached the same levels of popularity as its competing blockchain. However, from our perspective, from the proof of work perspective, it remains truer to, of course, the fundamentals of cryptocurrency and theoretically is more decentralized than its bigger brother, as well as remained true to code as opposed to Ethereum. Ripple now, on the other hand, is a somewhat com controversial cryptocurrency in that the developing company controls the entire coin supply. Not only that, of course, you should take into account that it does integrate with banks. And if you are for cryptocurrency, you are against the interference of third parties like banks. So why would you create an entire cryptocurrency based around integrating the banking system? It's almost as bad as CBDCs. It is meant as a, an alternative cross-border financial tool to SWIFT. Stellar, analogous to uh, XRP, XLM, also facilitates cross-border transactions and greater integration of crypto and fiat currencies. Uh, 
An update to the Coinbase wallet supported assets documentation revealed that the wallet is removing support for Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, XRP, and XLM due to low usage. It's key to note that this change only affects the Coinbase wallet. Coinbase's non-custodial wallet app and not or, and not Coinbase.com, the regular exchange, you'll still be able to buy Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, Ripple, Stellar on Coinbase and Coinbase Pro, which obviously like is good. It's kind of, well, it's kind of weird that you would remove it from the custodial version until you realize that that does require potential node updates and, and so on, right? The, the amount of support that you have to add into a wallet to continue to support it does make sense that you would be like, well, if it's not getting used a lot, we'll pull it down, right? From a liquidation standpoint for Ethereum Classic, it doesn't sound like you're going to have any uh, any additional struggles with uh, Coinbase. So you'll be able to basically deposit it, you know, as you mine it and then liquidate it. That being said, of course, there still is the extremely long confirmation times. And it will take you a couple days to get your Ethereum Classic into Coinbase. And that's been a problem since, of course, all of the hacks a couple of years ago. So when is the support going to be removed? The Coinbase wallet will remove support for the four cryptocurrencies on the 5th of December, 2022. However, that doesn't mean you lose access to your Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, XRP, and XML holdings as soon as the clock strikes 12. Coinbase notes that your cryptocurrencies will remain accessible through the Coinbase wallet recovery phrase. So there you go. Um, after January 2023, and that basically means just for the uninitiated, you can pretty much like recover any wallet to any wallet that supports the network, right? So if in theory, like if you have Ethereum Classic, you should be able to just come up to MetaMask, pop it open, recover the seed phrase and go. That's the point of controlling your seed phrase that even though like a wallet front end might not support it, other, other methods, you know, other wallets, et cetera, will support it. So keep that in mind. Um, according to Coinbase, these four cryptocurrencies have low trading volume on Coinbase wallet. That doesn't mean that they have low trading volume elsewhere. For example, according to CoinMarketCap, which measures trading volume across many exchanges, XRP has a daily trading volume ranging from $884 million on October 22nd to $3.9 billion on November 8th. Similarly, Ethereum Classic's daily trading volume regularly moves between $100 million to $400 million with some huge outliers too. And that's pretty impressive for Ethereum Classic, by the way. The simple fact of the matter is that despite trading volume in the wider market, Coinbase Wallet isn't seeing the same levels of interest and has decided to remove cryptos from its platform. Although Coinbase Wallet is removing support for Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, XRP, and XLM, you'll still find them on your favorite cryptocurrency exchanges available for trade. Now, uh, like I said, I think it's pretty impressive that we do see the, uh, the amount of volume that Ethereum Classic is seeing right now in trading, daily trading, and, you know, second out of these four to XRP is impressive too. XRP, I would presume, would be more purchased within centralized and utilized and stored within centralized exchanges just because of the nature of the type of people that purchase it. Bitboy Crypto, <coughs> sorry. Um, but the nature of people that purchase that stuff aren't really deep into the actual reasons behind cryptocurrency, the way cryptocurrency works and how you should actually operate your holdings. It's just, that's the fact of the matter. The type of people that watch you know, the BitBoy are the type of people that are purchasing XRP and they're purchasing it more than likely through centralized exchanges. So that makes sense totally there. On the complete flip side of that, you have Ethereum Classic, which is probably more than likely being held within, you know, custo uh, custodial wallets, right? And most people that are running those self-custody wallets for Ethereum Classic are probably not participating in anything that has Coinbase in the name at all. So there you go. That's kind of what I think would happen there. Now we have another really interesting one and that is the Apple Blocks Coinbase wallet release on iOS. Apple blocks the Coinbase wallet on iOS as per the details from a tweet thread. 
coin by Coinbase, iOS users will be unable to send NFTs from their wallets on iOS devices anymore. Apple blocks Coinbase wallet app release requesting 30% of all NFT transfer gas fees. Now, if you are a gamer, you've probably been following their lawsuit over the entire Fortnite thing uh, with Epic and, and Bethesda and all of that, right? And it's been extremely interesting because both companies are extremely greedy and it's funny to just watch them fight with each other over 30%. But now we're getting to a position where Apple is trying to basically get 30% from something that is uncontrollable, right? So for this to actually happen, the Coinbase wallet would have to essentially figure out how to grip those fees, basically making it centralized at the end of the day, and that'll never happen. The complete lack of understanding from Apple on how blockchain works should be a freaking embarrassment, bro. It is embarrassing that Apple, a technology company, would not understand how a self-custodial wallet would function. The main reason cited and mentioned by Coinbase is that the gas fees required to send NFTs need to be paid through their in-app purchase system so that they can collect 30% of the gas fee. Additionally, Coinbase mentioned that for anyone who understands how NFTs and blockchain work, Apple's request is impossible, like we were talking about. Quote, Apple's proprietary in-app purchase system does not support crypto, so we couldn't comply even if we tried, end quote, cited Coinbase. Coinbase also mentioned that this is similar to Apple trying to grab a cut of fees for every email sent over an open internet protocol. One of the biggest troubles with this action by Apple is that iOS users holding their NFT in an iPhone wallet have to go through a lengthy process to transfer the NFT. Quote, simply put, Apple has introduced new policies to protect their profits at the expense of the consumer or at the expense of consumer investment in NFTs and developer innovation across the crypto ecosystem. End quote. The action will definitely affect a whole sector of iOS users that are holding their NFTs in their iPhone wallets. Which, if you're doing that, I know there's probably. Oh, I know that there's a ton of people probably doing that. You know, luckily you can export your seed phrase. Hopefully you already have for Coinbase wallet. You can recover it somewhere else. But like, don't store. It's very, it's extremely, it's extremely dangerous to store crypto in any form, even if it's self-custodial, self-custody but in any form on a mobile device. It's, you know, like secondary to that is like a, a, a you know, a computer that's connected to the internet, but the a cell phone has more attack vectors than any other device in existence right now. If you're holding anything of value that you don't want to lose, right, on your cell phone, which I get it, like we hold so much data on our cell phone, but like this is not the way. Right? This is not the way. Don't hold all that data on your cell phone. It's ridiculous. Okay? I just... I just want to state that so you guys are aware. Right? Now, let's talk about the FTX contagion and how it impacts Bitcoin miners. Core scientific, BitFarms, and Genesis digital assets are among miners that have direct and indirect exposures to the fallout. Bitcoin miners, which have already up to $2.5 billion in loans outstanding, could find themselves in even hotter water as many have exposure to failed crypto exchange FTX and lenders such as BlockFi. Miners' balance sheets have been steadily deteriorating over the past few months as the price of Bitcoin has slumped, killing their revenue. Meanwhile, energy prices have soared, increasing their costs. This has resulted in one of the biggest mining data center operators in the U.S., Compute North, to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in September, while big players such as Core Scientific, Argo Blockchain, and Greenridge Generation have said they are in a liquidity crunch. 
The stock prices of all three publicly traded miners have plunged more than 90% this year. Now, some of the lenders working with these already struggling Bitcoin miners are in deeper trouble after getting caught up in the FTX blow up, potentially causing another major hit for the mining industry. ASIC financiers going through distress and bankruptcy will contribute to the cost of capital rising significantly in the space and access to capital drying up, said mining service firm Luxor Chiefs Operating Officer Ethan Vera, who also estimated the total debt of up to $2.5 billion outstanding for the miners. If lenders go bankrupt, creditors are likely to try to liquidate some of the equipment loans, he said. In some cases, it might be too difficult for a bankrupt company to continue to operate a loan book, in which case liquidating these existing loans will result in a significant haircut, according to Vera. Not many miners have direct exposure to FTX assets. However, the crypto exchange contributed to a $431 million funding round for miner Genesis Digital Assets in September of last year. The company spokesperson didn't comment on FTX's investment, but said GDA had no assets or accounts with FTX. General Digital Assets, or Genesis Digital Assets, excuse me, is not related to Coindesk's sister company, Genesis Global. Other key forms of exposures came from mining companies taking out large sums of loans from lenders such as BlockFi, Silvergate, and Galaxy Digital, all of which have some exposure to SBF's exchange. Still considering that many miners are private and don't share their debt obligations or exposure, the impact of FTX implosion is uncertain. We don't know where all of the exposed counterparties are. And so for the industry, it's really going to depend on where holes show up. Jamie Leverton, CEO of Hot 8, said during the firm's third quarter earnings call. BlockFi became one of the many victims of FTX contagion and filed bankruptcy protection in a federal court in New Jersey. Now, to be completely fair, BlockFi was going to go under anyways, but FTX bailed them out. So eh, tomato, tomato. Should have ditched them a long time ago. If you didn't see that one coming, I guess you weren't watching the channel. Because <laughs> we talked about it. We said it was coming. Regardless of, it, of what happened with FTX, it didn't even have to get related to FTX. It was coming. The miner, the U.S. is, or sorry, so this is for the lender holds at least three mining machines or three mining machine backed loans to publicly listed companies, crucially the $54 million that Core Scientific owes the lender. The miner, the U.S.'s biggest by computing power, is currently in talks to restructure its debt obligations that total at about $244 million in loans and $597 million in convertible and promissory notes at the end of the third quarter. A core scientific spokesperson did not respond to Coindesk's request for comment on this story. Canadian miner Bit Farms also borrowed $32 million from BlockFi, but only about $22 million of that is outstanding as of the end of September. Meanwhile, Peer Cipher Mining secured a $46.9 credit facility or joint venture, I think they mean million, with the energy firm WindHQ, of which it owes 49%. Or how, okay, so it's a 40 credit facility. Okay, these work differently. Um, a BitFarm spokesperson declined to comment on the story. The miner has been actively trying to reduce its leverage and said it paid down $27 million of Bitcoin and equipment back debt on November 14th. Cypher CEO Tyler Page said the company had drawn about $26 million of the BlockFi facility and never anticipated any further draws after a second one made in August. So it isn't concerned about BlockFi's issues. Less than $10 million of that is outstanding and the joint venture continues to service the debt as expected, Page said. BlockFi and other lenders also hold undisclosed debt to privately held miners, which is hard to estimate due to non-disclosure agreements. BlockFi spokesperson did not respond to request for comment on the story. Then we have Silvergate Capital. A digital asset bank and infrastructure provider said that of its $11.9 billion in customer deposits, only 10% belongs to FTX and the bank has no outstanding loans related to FTX. 
The crypto bank also said that its BlockFi digital asset deposit exposure totals less than $20 million. Of the biggest publicly traded miners, Marathon Digital has drawn $100 million in total, equally from two Bitcoin-backed debt instruments that have a cap at $100 million each, said Marathon's Vice President of Corporate Communications, Charlie Schumacher. One is a term loan and the other is a revolving credit facility, both with Silvergate Capital. Holy moly. <clears throat> One sec. As of November 9th, only 1,950 Bitcoin, about 30.6 million of Marathon's 11,440 Bitcoin, was unrestricted, meaning it can be used for business purposes, the firm said in its third quarter earnings report. If Bitcoin's price declined further, Marathon would have to post more collateral, hence restricting more of its Bitcoin holdings. The mining firm has decided to reduce some of its obligations given market uncertainty and volatility. And finally, Galaxy Digital. Michael Novogratz, Galaxy Digital, has $76.8 million of cash and digital assets tied to the exchange. The firm said it's in its third quarter earnings report. Um, let's see. Galaxy has been reported to be looking to cut nearly 62% of its exposure to FTX. Galaxy has also been active in lending to miners. BitFarms is one of the miners that secured a $100 million Bitcoin-backed credit facility from Galaxy. However, after paying down parts of the loan and amending some of the terms, the outstanding balance is $23 million at the end of the third quarter. Galaxy's exposure to FTX hasn't impacted its services and offerings for clients, and the, companies continue, or the company continues to take a prudent risk management approach toward financing arrangements in the mining space, said the firm's head of communications, Mike Worthstorn. Worst there we go. Worthstorn. Galaxy is not in distress, but other players that took significantly larger exposures will likely have issues according to Worthstorn. There we go. We are focused on secondary activity of ASICs, both from direct miners as well as lenders, and are in a good position to provide liquidity at good values for that equipment, he noted. During the third quarter, the Galaxy mining arm closed three existing machine leases, totaling about $8 million at expected terms without defaults, delinquencies, or losses, were Thorn added. The shares of Galaxy fell about 81% on the Toronto exchange this year. This is a nice wrap up. Bitcoin mining and staking firm Foundry has no direct exposure to FTX, but is indirectly tied to it through its sister company, Genesis Global, which is owned by Coindesk's parent company, Digital Currency Group. Genesis said its derivatives business unit has about $175 million of funds locked up into its FTX account. DCG granted a $140 million equity infusion to the trading firm. A Green Ridge spokesperson said it has an outstanding loan to Foundry, which is a fraction of the original amount, but said that its risk management strategy of liquidating Bitcoin mining revenue and removing all funds from exchanges daily was specifically designed to prevent exposure to exchanges. BitFarms owes just about $1.5 million to Foundry as of September 30th. Foundry declined to comment on the story. Canadian miner Hut8 said it paid off its debt to Foundry earlier this year and never drew from a $50 million credit from Galaxy, according to Aaron Dermer, Hut8's Senior Vice President of Communications and Culture. Meanwhile, another crypto lender, NYDIG, said it has consistently passed on opportunities to invest in the likes of FTX. Similarly, financial firm BlockFills says that it has zero exposure to Genesis Global, BlockFi, FTX, or Alameda Research. All of this obviously gives us a, a good sum up of like what crypto, different crypto mining firms are doing and what the likelihood of them, you know, going under is. That being said, a lot of people that we thought weren't going to go under are going under. And a lot of people, you know, I didn't expect cores to be in such a bad position that it now currently is in. I did kind of expect, you know, the problems with Compass Mining. We've been seeing that one coming for a while. We've been seeing BlockFi come for a while. You know, I didn't see FTX coming at the same time. I never really participated with FTX, so I didn't really have them on my radar to even pay attention to at all. Probably for the best, obviously. Um, 
of course, if I would have been paying attention, probably could have ca called out some of the red flags, kind of like we did with, you know, BlockFi. That being said, when we talk about the Bitcoin cycle, there is something extremely interesting that begins to happen. In traditional business, taking out basically long-term low interest loans to acquire basically assets such as computer equipment is a valid strategy. But due to the way that cryptocurrency fluctuates every four years based on the halving of Bitcoin, it has thrown a lot of companies for a loop. And this traditionally like kind of abused practice of having so much money that you can borrow so much more money ends up putting these people, putting these companies that are trying to move, you know, traditional business into cryptocurrency to fail. It's almost as if it was designed to make them fail. It was almost as if it was designed to, to, to make it fail, right? Which is extremely interesting if you start to talk about that from a, philosoph a philosophical viewpoint, especially as it pertains to why Bitcoin was created, etc. And now you compound that, you know, with, of course, rising interest rates, rising power costs, etc. And it just makes it that much worse. It's really interesting to watch this play out. I'd like to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below as well. As the com, or as well as the live chat, <clears throat> we still have quite a bit to get through. You know, we save a lot. We, if we're only doing one show a week, it's going to be a lot to get through. It just is what it is. Compass Mining launches Bitcoin Miner Protection Plan. This one's interesting because, you know, there's been a lot of issues with Compass. I don't trust them. You know, a lot of people don't trust them right now. They kind of have a bad reputation, but this is an interesting idea. It says the plan is initially available to customers hosted in Texas, South Carolina, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. Compass Mining, a firm that brokers Bitcoin mining machines and hosting services primarily to retail clients, said it is offering its first protection product so that customers can safeguard the Bitcoin mining machines. Insurance options for miners are severely limited, in part because traditional insurers have had a hard time coming up with plans for the nas uh, nascent industry. The new low-cost plan protects in case of fire, theft, government action, and electrical damage, said Will Foxley, director of content at Compass and Coindesk contributor. Now, Mr. Will hasn't been very upfront and and honest when we have asked very specific questions on Twitter previously in regards to some of the issues they've had with their mining farms. And if you're going to be buying or, or purchasing insurance from a company that basically is a brokerage, you put yourself in an extremely vulnerable position and I dare I say are probably wasting money. Um, as we saw with Compass, they were unable, incapable of returning user machines uh, from Russia to the end users. They had issues even returning machines from stateside uh, facilities that were getting closed down. Um, and then what this really plays out to me in particular is a cash grab because if you have essentially a failing company, if the company does end up failing or going bankrupt, etc. well, then what good was the, you know, what good is the, the insurance going to be in the first place, right? Um, this, is, this is just weird. Bitcoin mining is a burgeoning young industry. Simple protection products like this should be considered a financial primitive. Uh, Jam Jameson Nunny, the company's chief strategy officer, said in a statement, the newly launched product is available to customers hosted in Texas, South Carolina, Nebraska, and Oklahoma partner sites. Compass will expand it to other sites after the completing the initial rollout 
to its core clients. Compass doesn't own the facilities where its clients plug in their machines. It acts as a broker between the customers and facility owners. Quote, our protection plan is one step downstream of an over $75 million insurance policy we've created with our brokers, end quote, Foxley said. The mining firm has seen its fair share of troubles in the past few months. CEO and co-founder Whit Gibbs resigned in June amid a series of setbacks and disappointments, including severe delays in deploying equipment and having thousands of machines stranded in Russia. I would not purchase an ASIC mining, an ASIC miner insurance policy from Compass Mining ever. But, you know, that's not financial advice. Do what you will. I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Hmm. Let's get into an interesting proposal for CASPA. This is KIPO2. And this one in particular has to do with, of course, the consensus protocol, which would be including the mining algorithm, which would affect miners across the board. So Dagnite is a new consensus protocol written by the authors of this KIP, so CASPA Improvement Proposal, that achieves responsiveness while being 50% Byzantine tolerant. It is therefore faster and more secure than Ghost DAG, which governs the current CASPA network. In DK, for short, there's no a prior I co hard-coded parameter K, and consequently, it can adapt to the real K in the network. Concretely, in DK, clients or their wallets should incorporate K into their local confirmation policy of transactions, similarly to some clients requiring six confirmations in Bitcoin and some 30 confirmations. So the goal is to complete the research and development work necessary to implement DK for CASPA. Implement DK on CASPA as a consensus upgrade and add support and API for wallets, transaction acceptance policy to correspond to DK's confirmation speed. So the deliverables are as follows. Adapt the consensus algorithm to enforce a global maximum bound on network latency can be taken with a huge safety margin, does not affect confirmation times, which is necessary for difficulty in minting regulation, pruning, and more. Devise efficient algorithms to implement the DK procedures. The current uh, pseudocode is highly inefficient. The implementation will partially utilize the existing optimized ghost DAG code base as the latter is a sub procedure of DK research, the optimal uh, BPS, which is going to be blocks per second in terms of confirmation times and provide a recommendation. They will implement DK on Casper rust code base. So we would not see this in its current iteration, which is go, uh, you know, the go language. It'll have to get moved over to rust first. And then potentially this would happen. Design a transaction confirmation policy API and implement the supporting functionality in the node and documentation of consensus changes and API additions. So backwards compatibility wouldn't work because it would break the consensus rules and it would require a hard fork. Now, what would be interesting, of course, is if it does require a hard fork, you it won't matter that much if they implement it along with the Rust upgrade. So, you know... From my perspective, if I look at this, I would say, you know, put it in with the Rust upgrade if it happens at all uh, and 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 roll it out that way, you know, um, roll it out as a hard fork with that and then move forward. I think ru the Rust rewrite would have to be uh, be essentially the same. Right. Anyway, there you go. Uh, more Casper news.
You can mine it on Hero Miners. There you go. Let's get into minor releases for the day. I hope Dagnite goes through too as well. Um, it could be beneficial for miners too, especially GPU miners that there. I, there's a there's a slight hope that GPU miners get a longer life, especially with um, everything pushing to. Of course, the mining algorithm theoretically possibly doesn't change at all. I don't know. Have to dig more deep in there. I got to get a. Uh, I got to get one of them on to talk to us about it to give us really the tech, the full technical background of, of it. So I'll keep that in mind and try to get something worked out for you guys. LOL minor version 1.63 improved the Caspa only mining performance on NVIDIA Turing, Ampere and ADA GPUs by about 3.5%. They significantly improved the Caspa only mining energy efficiency on NVIDIA Turing, Ampere, and ADA GPUs by 7 to 11 percent, which is crazy depending on the actual model. And values given to dual factor parameter will now be checked and rounded, capped to working values. It can be higher in the case of card or was power limited before. They fixed a bug that was causing the miner to show a crash message when LOL miner was ended via the control C and they fixed a bug causing LOL miner to not start Caspa mining on Nvidia GPUs when the Nvidia OpenCL installation on the system is broken. In addition to that, we had a new release for Team Red Miner version 0.10.6. This release primarily adds the support for CVP13 and VCU slash BCU FPGA boards, but also includes a fix to allow Caspa mining on mining rig rentals. What are these? Well, this is where we're getting into FPGA devices, etc. And that is going to get really interesting really, really quick. That's why I said when we're talking about Caspa, we see this potential fork, uh, which could maybe change what's happening here. But for the interim, what we are seeing pretty much confirmed, like right off the bat, obviously here is that the E300s are popping, right? The E300s being the ASIC boards. The ASIC boards, uh, to be clear, are the ASIC miner that is going to be created, the E300, is actually three, I, I think it's three or four, uh, essentially, FPGA boards put into a single unit, right? So it's not like, a, it's closer to what an ETH ASIC was than to what a Bitcoin uh, mining ASIC is, right? And it actually does have HBM, uh, eight gigabytes of HBM2 on these particular boards. So they renamed the E300 to E335C in preparation for supporting additional FPGA devices on the E300 boards. Why is that? Well, we are looking at, best I can tell from people that I've been talking to in the industry, we're looking at a faster E300. So... Those initial E300s, they're sold out. They are getting shipped out. They're, my, they're in very low quantities. Um, so if you thought a ton of these were going on, like, online, no, we're talking about kind of quantities of, like, 500 to 1,000 at a time, right? We're not talking about, like, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, like, units, that sort of thing. We're talking about pretty low quantities, because they are FPGA boards at the end of the day that are going into the ASICs. So like the next batch that's going to be upgraded looks to be from between like three to 500. And uh, I'm going to try to get all confirmation for these for this stuff for you guys. But I have one of the newer FPGAs that's supposed to be going into the newer E335s or updated ones. So I have a single FPGA board. It's actually sitting over here. Hold on, I'll grab it for you guys. So we're going to be getting this hooked up this week for you guys. Oh, and um, yeah, so this one is, let me get the actual info for you guys on this one.
So this is this is a modded FK33. Um, there's actually only this design. There's only four total in existence, and I have one of them. So there's literally only four of these in total existence right now. So pretty cool. Excited to play with this. There is presumably support uh, on, because of the extended support on Team Red Miner here, we are going to be able to run the, this one. This should get us around 2.6 giga hash a second or so. I believe. Yeah, somewhere between like 2.3 and 2.6 giga hash a second at around 60 watts. So there you go. I'm excited for it. Uh, I don't have testing equipment here. So when I go back to the farm this week during the evening while I'm not working, I'll be testing this out. So uh, that's kind of what we're working on as far as that's considered. Now, let's talk about mining profitability or lack thereof. Right after a word from today's sponsor. And by the way, uh, if you guys are looking at ASIC mining repair, definitely check these guys out. Um, without Scott, I would not be having connections to start learning about FPGA, which means that I would not be able to teach you guys about FPGAs. And the fact of the matter is, is like, it's extremely difficult to get the, the, these types of connections. So um, one of the things I was gonna point out that's really interesting is you can get a lot of really good connections by going to some of these events, um, very valuable ones. So if you're looking for stuff like that, it's just something to keep in mind. Today's spot isn't really a sponsor. It's more of just an opportunity for you all if you have interest in ASIC Minor Repair. ASIC Minor Repair is currently in high demand, and right now there are certification trainings that you can do in Wisconsin. Now, I have some links down below the channel for a November batch and a December batch for certifications for ASIC Minor Repair. So if you have interest in micro soldering, Bitcoin mining, just general troubleshooting, and of course, making money, then go ahead and check them out. You can use promo code SONOFATECH for 5% off. Yes, I know that's not a huge discount, but it is a discount nonetheless, and it's something that I wanted to bring to y'all because I know we've been discussing the high demand for it in the chat and also just the channels that we uh, communicate on, both on Twitch and YouTube. So definitely check that out. And I will be at the November event. So if you want a chance to meet me, you could sign up for the November event, even though that is short notice. And I would be happy to try to meet up with you out there.
Sorry, guys. I was muted. It is what it is. I hit the wrong button. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, we're back. Sorry about that. Uh, nothing's profitable is all I was saying anyways. So, um, essentially what you got going on is the best you can optimize in a 3090, for example, is that you can get to about 748 mega hash a second at 140 Watts. And that'll get you to only losing two cents a day on Caspa. But there are a few other options that you could look into in general. So um, I highly recommend that uh, as far as what, how would I put this? Internal IT infrastructure for CASPA is a big deal. If and we're going to be talking about this on locals and uh, later, um, but I can point you like I can hint you in the right direction of like basically internal infrastructure for CASPA is a big deal, and there are some things that I'm learning that are pretty game changing. Now, miningpoolstats.stream, let's go ahead and start looking at everything. Over the past seven days, Bitcoin is up 3%, and we are at 258 exahash a second. Lots of hash rate coming offline, right? 288 exahash a second down to 258 exahash a second. A lot of stuff's coming offline. This more than likely, obviously, is due to like all of these miners capitulating at this point. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Classic. Down 1.84% over the past seven days. Still sitting pretty much at 141 terahash a second. No huge change, actually, from the last time we checked. Interestingly enough, ETH Proof of Work had a 17% pump over the past seven days and is sitting at 21 terahash a second. Ethereum Fair is up 2.8% 2 2 over the past seven days and is sitting at 2 terahash a second. Take a look at Ergo. Ergo is up 1.45% over the past seven days and is down to 25 terahash a second from about 30 terahash a second. It was sitting around that 30 terahash a second for a while and it's come down quite significantly. Difficulty is adjusting back out though as well. And Flux, I believe, had the biggest pump of the past seven days at 22% up and is sitting at 5.57 mega solutions a second. There's probably potential for it to handle a little bit more hash rate coming up soon. Now, Caspa, I believe, is actually down ever since we talked about it, down 18%. Because I dumped on y'all. You know what I mean? Go check the address down in the description. Uh, but we are at 356 terahash a second. But that's not the whole story because a lot of people are solo mining. 454 terahash a second on the network. Simply insane. Massive increase in difficulty and a drop in price. Not what you want to see, of course. But it is what it is. There's its kind of little brother, but it is a Bitcoin cash fork sitting at plus 10% over the past seven days and at 49 terahash a second. ASIC minor profitability, the Inosilicon A8 plus crypto master, 480 watts, which I have not seen before on crypto night is apparently doing stupid money. So all of this DNX stuff appears to be broke, but I'd like to hear more about what's going on with, DNX and why it's broken right now. That being said, first place is the KA3 at 4916 a day. However, most of these have not shipped out yet. They are supposed to be shipping mid month uh, this month. And minor L7, really like in deployment, most profitable still, sitting around $20 a day if you're merge mining. You know, if you're just mining Doge, I mean, or if you're mining the nice hash, more than likely probably doing somewhere around. $14 a day merge mining. Ant Miner D7 comes in after that at $10.36 a day in Dash. I pull a G1 at $5.70 a day. 
And that is going to pretty much do it. Let's scroll down and take a look at the S19 Pro, which is losing money every day, unfortunately, right now. And that is par for the course at 10 cents a kilowatt hour on the Bitcoin miners. So there you go. Now, let's get into questions and answers for the day. Remember, Super Chats are never required. Always appreciated. First to be answered because they're the easiest to read. I no longer have the pressure or as much pressure on me. Um, so everything that we make will be pumped right into improving the channel again. Back to where, back to where I actually am comfortable with the channel. Feels good. Sorry about the mute earlier, guys. If you also want to hear from me, tag at son of a tech and it will highlight the message orange and I'll be able to respond more effectively. <clears throat> hey, Billy, I believe there is sound. I did just check that because we had some issues earlier with it. I'll double check it again though. And it will hide. Yeah, it is good. Please tag at son of a tech with your question so it's easy to read. Detroit Iris says at son of a tech, how's the new job? Uh, it's good, man. It's good. Uh, there's a gym, so I get to work out, which is awesome. I work out at noon. Like today, I ran for 45 minutes and then showered because there's a shower there too, uh, which is super convenient for me. Uh, I like to work out a lot. That lets me get in an extra workout, um, which is super beneficial. Uh, probably some of the best coworkers I've ever run into off the bat. Um, as far as like, um, I've never done internal IT. It seems to be a lot less stressful than my previous jobs for the most part. Uh, we'll see as we get into it more deeply, right? Uh, and then as far as the work itself, you know, I'm still kind of spinning up, you know, getting the cell phone, getting the, getting the computer, getting access to everything, all that sort of stuff, right? So it is what it is. Like it's not necessarily, you know, fully ramped up. I know what the work is, but it's, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Um, well, the PDA says, ask him to take anything new on the Komodo project. No, I, uh, my, my day right now is like, I'll, I'll tell you. So I've been waking up at like four 30. Um, so in, I, I pack my lunch, uh, hop in the truck, go to the gym. I do cardio for about an hour. Um, and then I will, uh, shower, sauna, shower, drive to work, work, get off of work, go to jujitsu, pretty much go straight to jujitsu. Then I'm at jujitsu till about eight 30, get done with jujitsu at eight 30, go back to the gym, lift some weights, shower, sauna, shower, uh, eat some turkey <laughs> and pack for the next day. Cause I have to pack like two bags basically. Cause I'm working out a lot. So I'll pack everything up, get it all like set out, you know, shirts, hanger, everything ready to go. Uh, re, you know, reset up my bed. Cause I take down and put the bed up every day. Go to bed, wake up at four 30, rinse, repeat. So it's kind of what I've been doing. Now, today, I took kind of a rest day. Um, no jujitsu at night because I got the kids and uh, I, I slept in. <coughs> uh, let's see. Gandalf says, that's time of attack. Will we be talking more about FPGAs on locals after... Uh, no, because here, like the thing, like everybody wants FPGAs and that's cool. But like the one that I got, there's only four of them in existence. The line that I have on them right now, 
I'm not even really sure how I'm going to get that dispersed out to everybody, right? So I'm, I'm still in my learning phase. So I'm going to talk about them as I learn about them. But the biggest problem with FPGAs is access, right? Uh, and I don't know if there's a way to actually get retail access. Right. Um, Noisy Room says, "As time deck, what kind of information are you sharing on locals?" Red Panda Mining gave you credit for the Caspa call. Uh, yeah, I mean, Caspa was obviously shared earliest on on uh, locals. I do share over there what I'm mining, buying, all that sort of stuff as I do as I can. Right now, like we'll probably like. Here's the deal: there are so. I will say this: there are so few FPGAs available that I will probably only sell them to locals members because there will just, I probably can't get my hands on a lot of them. Like we're probably only going to be able to ever get our hands on like a handful. Right. And so I think like with stuff like that, there will be benefits for being a member because that's where the sports at. Right. Um, That's a, that's just, it's just a tricky one, right? Because at the end of the day, like what you want to be able to do is like help everyone. But it, it kind of what locals does is allow us to um, keep smaller networks from getting flooded too quickly, right? Like Caspa early on and stop, you know, I guess equipment from getting flooded too quickly. Um, truck says more random question are you holding on to some meow coin i didn't touch meow coin yeah i just don't do i i i'm not i just don't i don't i don't do meme coins much you know like i started mining doge but there's too many of them i don't know Mining Potato says, "Ask Simon Tech, what GPUs are you mining now? Uh, of yours are mining now. None are mining right now, Mining Potato. I did have some 3070s and 3090s on. Detroit says, "Ask Simon Tech, are you YouTubing, or, or are you are you being being IT or in the USC? I get I get what you're saying uh, because of the workouts. Actually, I do have a, uh, I have a goal that I set for myself, but I'm not going to actually, uh, reveal that. I'm just going to do the work in silence and then you'll see. But I do have a goal surrounding that and I've set a very specific goal. My potato says, are you still running the 1660s? I'm not running anything right now. Uh, Xavier says, there's, I think I said that right. Says, as I'm thinking, are you planning on getting a 7,900 XTX? I won't have the money this month. Um, unfortunately there's too many things going on to, to have the revenue for it. But once I have the revenue for it, yes, we'll be getting it for testing. I should try to sell a couple, probably 30 nineties right now while they're going for 800 a piece and buying one. But like, I don't know when I would have the time. If you guys are interested in a couple 3090s or something or want to buy a couple of my cards to help me buy a 7900 XT, then uh, that'd be good. That'd be cool. Trinity Black says, At some attack, I'm mostly on Ergo, but would, would dual mining Caspa be a good idea? Uh, you're going to generate more heat, but it is the winter, so dual mining is becoming uh more feasible right now but the the benefit of caspa as it sits on a gpu right now is that it, it, it it's power efficient because you lock the core clock or the sorry the memory clock you you do the core clock as well but the primary power savings is turning off the memory essentially so if you're not getting that benefit, I mean, I guess you're still getting the, you're still getting the erg 
it's just you inch you typically just you know introduce more points of failure at the end of the day i guess for not that much more advantage and then the the pure like good thing about caspa is the one thing you aren't doing anymore Mike B says, "Last time I think I'm looking for a 3090 for the win ultra three. If you got any, I have two of them. One's in this machine right here. But if you're interested, hit me up. I would have to ship it out to you. I'd have to pack it up like Sunday. So if you don't tell me, uh, like if, if you don't tell me, you know, over the weekend, it'll be until next weekend. I'm just too flat out on the weekdays right now. Uh, and then I'm just selling the hardware to buy the 7900 XT boy, Matthew. That would be it. Um, Billy says, that's how I think. Did you run across anybody at your work that knew you from YouTube? I got hired because of YouTube. Uh, the director of it watches the channel. What's up, buddy? <laughs> Monkey says, as I'm a tech, I'll see you at locals towards the end of the month when I get my first paycheck. I'll support in whatever way I can afford, pal. Thanks, dude. Sell enough GP offline GPUs to buy an ultra CPU? I haven't heard of the ultra CPU. Sounds interesting. John English Tech says, as I'm a tech, hey, man, nice to see you just checking in. Good to see you too, man. How was the first week of the new job? Good. We kind of already talked about that, so I won't repeat it. You can rewatch the channel or rewatch this later if you want. We're going to go talk about more, though, here. Uh, it is time to move over to locals. So we're going to be moving over to locals now for the stream. It will also be streamed on Rumble. So that is kind of where we're headed. And then Bojangle said, did you see the specs of the 7990 XTX? No, but we'll take a look over at locals. We're going to be streaming on locals till 1 a.m. Central Time. I think it is. Yeah. We'll be streaming on locals until 1 a.m. Central Time. Actually, at this point, we'll have to go till 1.15 to hit our needed time. So we will be streaming over there in just a second. I want to thank everybody that supported over here, everybody that showed up for a stream that, you know, we are in the works on. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that, you know, it at least gets you a little bit of your crypto news fix um, and that we will see you next Tuesday, a.k.a. next Friday, because we will be streaming it again next Friday. I will answer this last one because it's a huge super chat. Most money we've made on YouTube today from uh, Anasta Tech. There we go. I, did I say that correctly? I'm, apologies if I didn't. So thanks for the content. Hang in there. Better days are ahead of us. Oh, it's going to be amazing, my man. So let me get you guys a link to Locals. And, oop. Yeah, that's the right one. Oops. Something like that. That is the best place to chat. Um, but the best place to watch quality-wise, technically, is going to be this one. And we are going to be reacting to the upper echelon video of BitBoy Crypto first. And then we'll be moving on from there. I'll see you next Tuesday.